So I'll, I'll do certainly, Liam. But can I do that? Perhaps first, just note and appreciate two of the things that the Archbishop said that really struck my ear as I was just thinking about this evening and the whole question of inclusive growth, uh, which is something we do think a lot about at the, the Resolution Foundation. The first thing was the note of optimism, which I was really yes. very grateful Absolutely. for. We all know there's a lot wrong with the way our Absolutely. economy works. We see that every day. We know that there are large numbers of families struggling despite the fact that they're working very long hours, often two workers in every household, uh, still to make ends meet and to have any kind of disposable income or control or sovereignty over their circumstances. And yet that note of, of, of positive comment regarding creativity, the very heart of what makes good societies work, that people, when they come together, can innovate, can create, that there are moments in history where we've seen bursts of innovation that have led mm. to real advances in living standards that have gone on for decades. I think that's a, a worthwhile corrective to otherwise what might be a, a doom and gloom scenario. Yeah, and the second thing that struck my ear again about what the Archbishop said there was he said that large cash transfers, on one hand, and hoping for the collateral benefits of the market, I hope I've got your quote right there, uh, to work well, uh, for people are both unfounded or unsustainable ways for us to create a good economy. They might at any one time be additive. We've seen periods of growth where the market's been effective uh, under some form of regulation and control. And we've certainly seen moments where large cash transfers have been needed to remediate very poor situations. But they're not enough. Those two levers can't get us where we need to go. And that's what takes me, I guess, to answering why 10 years ago we set up the foundation. It was because trying both those things over various successive periods of British public life in the 60s, the 70s and 80s, swinging back and forward between those two models, simply wasn't working to maintain a decent working uh, model for people in terms of how they shared in the benefits of growth. Mm. The model is very simple. Since the Second World War, we've had a long period of time in which productivity across the industrialised West was shared equally amongst all working people. Yeah. If you look at the line for productivity and the share of the benefit of that productivity with the bottom half of workers across the West, that line is rock solid from 1945 onwards for many decades. And then suddenly it began to break. It broke first in the United States in 1977 with productivity continuing to rise, but the bottom half of workers no longer sharing in the benefit of that. In 1992, the next country to fall was Canada, where again the link broke and has never come back. And in 2003, it broke in the same year in Germany and the United Kingdom. And it's never come back. And every year since, productivity has continued, but no pay has fallen through to the bottom half of workers in our country. That was the founding clarion call for us in 2003 that led us 10 years ago in 2005 to form the foundation and study what was happening to the bottom half of working households in Britain. We're now in a position where only 12 pence in every pound of GDP growth we get flows through to the bottom half. Does anyone think that is fair? Would anyone call that a good society? And so 10 years ago, we stepped back and began to look at two things. And I think we've had some success on one hand, and I feel we've done very poorly on the second. The first thing was to look at the short-term levers that could be pulled for that bottom half of workers. Things like childcare, wages policy, okay. the question of whether second earners in a household ought to be able to earn something and have that second earner income disregarded from any pound-for-pound -pound offset against tax credits or other cash transfers from the state to provide an incentive for work. Yeah. All of those levers different governments have looked at and have paid some attention to. And I feel very grateful for the amount of engagement the politicians I've seen over the last 10 years have begun to share with this issue we now call the squeezed middle. 11 million people in Britain with 4 million, four million work, uh, children in their houses and living in 8 million homes across Britain and now getting in some areas in pockets, isolated areas of support or underpin that have come from, from politicians across the whole political spectrum. So that's the short term. We must continue with that. There's many more levers we can pull there. Yeah. Where I don't feel, frankly, we've made enough progress over our first 10 years as a group is on the longer term. How do you fix that model? How do you get to the point where there's some automatic sharing of the benefits yeah. of productivity Absolutely. in a situation where workers have lost their collective bargaining rights, where we're unable to actually command much of a premium for our work because machines, technology, outsourcing, and other, uh, other things can compete for the value of that work and that labor, and where the size of the service sector and the non-traded the non sector has grown so large that your ability to command a premium for your labor uh, has dropped. 
And that whole question of fixing the longer term is why I'm so excited, Liam, that you and a group of your colleagues across the political spectrum have decided to form this group uh, and to invite uh, input and, and, and contributions to fixing that model. Yeah, that's a brilliant, brilliant start of the 10. Thank you. Um,